we are ready to begin. My name is Leslie Kershane. I am the CEO of the Tri-Cities Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It is my pleasure to introduce the Vice Chair of the Board of Directors for the Tri-Cities Chamber, Jennifer Wright, for some opening remarks. Thank you and good evening everyone. I'd like to begin by respectively acknowledging that this all candidates meeting is taking place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Quiquitlam First Nation. We thank the Quiquitlam who continue to live on these lands and care for them, along with the waters and all that is above and below. Welcome to the Tri-Cities Chamber of Commerce Coquitlam All Candidates Meeting presented by the Chamber's Group Insurance Plan. My name is Jennifer Wright and I'm the Chamber Board Vice Chair and General Manager at Wessel Plateau Golf and Country Club. As you may know, the Chamber is neutral in all elections. It is stated in our bylaws that we shall not endorse any particular candidate for public office. The Chamber greatly values its role as a convener of business, community, and government to foster dialogue and focus on solutions to strengthen our communities. We are passionate about advancing local prosperity, and we look forward to working closely with the newly elected mayors and councillors in the Tri-Cities following the elections, as we have done with the current ones over the past four years. On behalf of the Chamber Board of Directors and members, Thank you to all the candidates for participating tonight and to everyone joining us in person and live on Zoom. Now I'd like to invite to the stage our moderator for tonight's evening, Chamber Board Governor and Council at DBM Law, Richard Rainey. Thank you, Jennifer, and good evening, everyone. Uh, the municipal election in Coquitlam is October 15th, where Coquitlam residents will vote to elect one mayor, eight councillors, and four school trustees. And tonight we'll be meeting all of the mayoral candidates and just about all of the uh, candidates for the councillor position. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that we'll be using technology for today's meeting with the Slido app. Uh, the, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, if you go to slido.com, and there's an event code there. Um, we'll be using that for tonight's discussion. All you have to do is launch the internet browser on your phone, go to slido.com, key in the event code ACM-COQ. Uh, you can type in your questions or vote for questions that are already on the app that interest you. Uh, Pre-submitted questions have already been loaded, so you can view them, vote for them, uh, and uh, they'll be prioritized in that basis. Uh, we may edit a little bit for overlap and duplicity and, and relevance, but um, the, the idea there is that you can ask the questions through the app and they'll be uh, prioritized based on your votes. Now, please note, as you can see, there are a lot of candidates here. I wasn't sure whether these were the candidates and that was the crowd or vice versa. So not every candidate will be able to answer each question we ask tonight. And you'll not be able to direct your question to a particular candidate as we want to ensure that every candidate has the opportunity to answer the same number of questions tonight in fairness to each of them. So if you're forming your questions, please make them uh, in such a manner that it would be something all the candidates could, uh, could answer. So let's go over the format of tonight's meeting. Uh, first, each candidate will have 60 seconds to introduce themselves and their platform. We'll do it uh, very scientifically using the alphabet, starting with Brent Asmundson. And then uh, we'll call up uh, groups of three or four candidates at a time to the front here and they'll have an opportunity to answer questions posed uh, by me from the Slido app. Each group of candidates will uh, be asked a question, then they'll have 60 seconds each to respond, starting with the first name called. Once all group members have answered, there'll be an option for candidates to ask and answer follow-up questions from each other. So that's the debate component. Um, given the number of people, it's not going to be something that we're going to be able to spend a lot of time on, but we'll do our best. Uh, after all the groups have completed the Q&A portion, candidates will take the stage again in their groups and be asked to give a 30-second closing statement. Um, audience, because of the, the time nature of this event, we ask that you hold any applause until the end of each section, and we'll do our best to end the event at 9 p.m. or shortly thereafter. I should also mention we have one council candidate, I believe just one that uh, wasn't able to make it tonight due to unforeseen circumstances. Is it two? So I know that uh, Brian Macera and my notes... Mo, Mo Darwish isn't able to make it as well, but all the other council candidates uh, are here. 
And last, uh, before we get started, it's my uh, great pleasure to thank the, uh, the chamber members on the stage here, to Leslie, Operations Manager Christina Brown for overseeing the slide of questions and for timing candidates' answers tonight. The timing will be ruthless, so please respect the timing. Uh, you'll be ejected through little, little things underneath your chairs if you go over. So candidates, are you ready? All right. Brent, the chair is yours, and when you're done, if you could just pass it down the line. Craig, when you're done, uh, to Adele and uh, Richard, to Steve. I just have a question. Is there going to be like a timer on the screen? Or? There is not. Correct. No timer on the screen. Hi, my name is Brent Asenson. I'm a 32-year resident of Coquitlam. I'm married with two grown children, two grandchildren, and I'm honored to serve the residents of Coquitlam. I'm seeking re-election to continue working for our community to support sustainable growth helping create an affordable housing and implementing sound environmental practices. I'm committed to making sure your municipal tax dollars are spent wisely and provide great community facilities at cost-effective infrastructure improvements while ensuring that the city is business friendly and focused on keeping our neighborhoods safe. We all have a voice in local government and I'm dedicated to making sure that your voice is heard. So on October 15th, please vote Brent Asmussen for council. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Rob Bottas, and I'm running for Quilton City Council. I've lived in the community since 1978. Sorry, is this working, by the way? All right, sorry. I've lived in the community since 1978 when my mother purchased a home here in hopes of uh, making a better life for my sister and I. At that time, Quilton's population was approximately 60,000 persons. Today, we're nearing 150,000, and we are projected to grow to over 200,000 within the next decade. Our city must meet the needs of a diverse, growing, and aging population. We must attract services and provide facilities in our neighborhoods that keep pace with the growth, including affordable housing for seniors, youths, and families. We need to provide that mix of housing alternatives, all while mitigating the impacts of climate change and preserving our environment. Throughout my life, one thing has remained constant, my commitment to an inclusive Coquitlam. As a lifetime volunteer in our community, I've given of my, way, I've given of my time, so I've given my time and talents in many ways. I've contributed to service organizations, uh, community organizations, task forces, and civic committee work. I've been an advocate in both print media and public forums for Coquitlam's needs. Our, on October 15th, please vote Rob Bottas. Thank you. Okay, I want to thank the Chamber of Commerce for organizing this event. My name is Phil Buchan. My wife and I have lived in Coquitlam for nine years. Coquitlam was ill-served when council failed to hold the by-election required by law. Other municipalities, including Lytton, which was devastated by wildfire, complied with provincial law and held by-elections following the 2021 federal election. As a councillor, I will obey all legislation, not pick and choose. Housing should be affordable, accessible, and obtained without barriers. I will press council to require more below-market housing units in all new developments. We need to protect the tree canopy in Coquitlam. I want to preserve the world-class tree collection at Riverview. Existing bus services are inadequate. Service to developing areas arrive too little too late. I will urge Council to work with TransLink to provide the bus services our community needs. On October 15th, please vote for Phil Buchan. Good evening, all. Thanks, Leslie, Richard, Jennifer. Thanks to the Tri-City Chamber of Commerce for hosting this important event. My name is Ben Craig. I'm your independent candidate for Coquitlam City Council. I've been working for the residents of Coquitlam since the first day I moved my family here. I've had hundreds of interactions with City Hall over the years, and I'll make the following observation. Our local government has become disconnected with us, the residents who finance this operation. Nowhere was this more evident than during the COVID crisis. Between the years 2021 and 2020, while Coquitlam families were struggling to make ends meet, our local government was hiring across every department and even creating some new departments. Members of the chamber, Coquitlam residents, this has to stop. I've been a financial advisor for over 30 years. I help families budget and save for retirement. 
I believe our local government should budget in the same way our Coquitlam families do. That means we all need, want nice things, but they must fit into our budget. My name is Ben Craig. Hi, everyone, and also just want to echo thank you to the Chamber for putting this on today, and thank you to everyone for coming out today. My name is Matt DeJohnlick, and I'm a candidate for Coquitlam City Council. I've lived most of my life here in Coquitlam, and for the last eight years, I've been one of your library board trustees, where I've worked with City Hall to expand programming at the libraries, look at new English language classes and study spaces, and bringing in a new book bus. I've also had the privilege of working with the provincial government in areas of housing and mental health. I think we got a great city in Coquitlam. It's a place where young families are looking to come to live and where we have newcomers coming from all over the world to make it home. This brings us great opportunities, but also new challenges. As a city councillor, I'm going to advocate for more amenity spaces, recreation centres, pool space, as well as ice rink space, so our kids and seniors and everyone can have a place to play. We also need to look at more park space as people work from home and as we've really discovered some of the gems of parks that we have in this community during the pandemic. And of course, housing remains a huge priority. We need housing for the young families that are making this home, as well as the seniors that are looking to downsize and stay here in Coquitlam. So on October 15th, please vote Matt DeJohnlick. Good evening. My name's Craig Hodge, and it's been my honor to have served you as your city councillor for the past 11 years. I grew up in Coquitlam. I went to Centennial Secondary School. I spent my career working in this community as a photojournalist, and from there I saw firsthand the issues that face our, our residents. I'm a past president of this chamber, and I'm also past president of the Heritage Society. I've coached soccer, ball hockey, and I'm currently a scout leader here in Coquitlam. My wife Darla and I were fortunate to buy a house and raise our three boys here in Coquitlam, the third generation of my family to call Coquitlam home. And, and I want other generations, other people in this community to be able to do the same. So we must ensure that, we, that new housing includes affordable rental and ownership options for families, for young people, for our workers, and for our seniors who want to downsize but remain in the communities that they helped in the neighborhoods that they helped to, to build. I, I represent Coquitlam on the uh, Metro Vancouver Regional Board. Uh, on that, I serve on the Regional Parks Committee, the Zero Waste Committee, and I'm on a number of policing committees. Thank you. Thank you, and good evening. I'm Adele Gamar, and I'm running for mayor of this great city, my home. Building a city for everyone begins with one humble task, listening. Listening is the foundation of leadership. And for the past many months, I have been listening to the citizens of Coquitlam, having knocked on over 3,000 doors, meeting at kitchen tables, living rooms, and parks. I've been listening to your hopes, your challenges, your struggles, and your dreams. What I'm hearing is a call for change for a mayor who will build a responsive and transparent city that puts people and neighborhoods first. I'm running to be your voice, to champion the issues that matter to you, and do what needs to be done to make Coquitlam an even stronger and more vibrant community. That's my vision. I hope that you will join me, and together we'll build a city for everyone. Thank you so much. Good evening, my name is Mark Mahovlich and I'm running for mayor of uh, Coquitlam and uh, I've lived here my whole life. I was born at RCH um, and uh, I attended Monte Centennial and Douglas College for school, scholastic re, uh, issue, or, uh, education and uh, I, was a, I am a journeyman carpenter. Um, I'm also an elite hockey referee and uh, I also have uh, made many movies in this city driving cars behind cameras. And um, I'm also an author. I've re released a, a, a conspiracy book on Amazon. And uh, okay, anyway, <laughs> a little more in time than you need. Here you go, Richard. So thank, thank you very much. Yes, uh, all the candidates agreed that the one opening minute was about ourselves and our platform. So um, I've lived all my life in, here in Coquitlam on the traditional territory of the Coquitlam First Nation. And we've worked really hard. I, I'm so proud of this council because we've been able to build consensus on a whole range of issues from uh, indigenous relations and childcare and seniors and 
housing and climate change, environmental management, economic development and local prosperity, crime and uh, public safety, parks and rec. I've done a bunch of regional work, chairing housing and regional planning and currently chairing the liquid waste committee that's working on moving all, us, this region, toward tertiary treatment so that we can protect our wildlife. But our biggest passion and one of our biggest issues is mental health, and I can want to continue to work on that enormous issue, uh, partly because of our own personal experience, but partly because it affects each one of us. So please, re-elect Richard Stewart. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Hi everyone, my name is Steve Kim. I'm a first term city councillor seeking your vote for re-election. My family moved here in 1981. I graduated from Centennial and currently have three generations of my family living, working, studying across the Tri-Cities. In 2018, you voted for me to provide a new diverse voice on council. I'm a bridge builder with a balanced approach and a collaborative leadership style. Since then, I'm proud of my record on key initiatives on affordable rental housing, economic development, environmental strategies, child care, and parks and rec, to name a few, all while respecting our taxpayers' dollar. But rising tides must lift all boats. During this time of recovery, we still have heavy lifting to do. I will continue to tackle our affordability challenges, diversify our economy by focusing on cultural hubs, small businesses, and entrepreneurship. I support innovative green strategies and active transportation networks to make our city more livable. So I'm asking for your support again. Please vote Steve Kim on October 15th. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Paul Lambert. I've been a resident for, of Coquitlam for over 20 years, and tonight I hope to earn your vote for City Council. There are a lot of candidates in this election, so I'd like to take this opportunity to highlight five things that separate me from other candidates. Number one, I do not take donations from developers. Number two, I am a truly independent candidate for city council. I am nonpartisan and not affiliated with political parties. Number three, as a result, my platform is free from outside influence. Number four, my approach is to genuinely listen to what residents are saying, then represent their needs and wants in a clear manner. This allows me to represent the number one concern I hear from residents across Coquitlam. That is, Coquitlam is developing and growing too much and too quickly, and we need to slow down to a more moderate level. Residents are also saying that all of this growth doesn't seem to be helping affordability much. That means we need to change the type of housing we're building and make sure the housing we build actually benefits Coquitlam residents. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sean Lee. I'm seeking a seat on Coquitlam City Council again this year because I want to positively transform and prepare Coquitlam for a better future with my ed education, experience, and expertise. I'm an IT expert in the medical and IT industry, specialized in predictive analysis. When I first ran for Coquitlam City Council in 2018, I came up with a platform to transform Coquitlam into a cutting-edge medical city by attracting IT and medical industry to our city. In 2020, our community was hit by the global pandemic. That's when constituents began to recognize the imperative, innovative nature of my platforms and have been showing steadfast and resolute support throughout the global pandemic. I am fully aware that younger generations are facing challenges in owning their houses. We are entering into the period of stagflation where cost of living like rent, food, and gas prices are inflating while wages are stagnating. My name is Sean Lee. Thank you. Good evening. Joining you tonight from the Quiquedin Lens. My name is Trish Mandeo, and I am seeking re-election on our city council. I am an independent candidate and I am someone who believes that governance is leadership. 
in leadership is good governance. And we are called, whoever you're going to select, is called to sit at the table to ask the right questions. Truth be told, none of us here are gonna be doing the work, but we are gonna be there to govern, and we are gonna be there to be asking the tough questions. You can be guaranteed that from the day that I was elected in 2018, I have asked the right questions. I had no influence from anyone. And I will continue to work for you and to advocate for the things that we know that is rampant in our community right now. We know we're talking about housing, mental health. We're talking about affordability and all these other issues. What those needs is our relationship with the other levels of government. And I recently, just last week, got elected by my peers across Canada to sit on UBCM. Vote Trish Mandeo, and I will continue to advocate for collaboration with us. Good evening. My name is Dennis Mars, and I'm asking for your vote for re-election to City Council on October the 15th. I have a background in finance as a credit union bank manager for 25 years and a long history of the coach and referee in minor hockey, baseball, and soccer. Since 1979, I've called Coquitlam home, and I've served several years on this Chamber of Commerce board, including as president and chair of the policy committee. I've served as treasurer of the Eagle Ridge Hospital Foundation for over six years. As your counselor, I've served as chair of numerous committees, including economic development, cultural services, sports, representative on the healthcare roundtable, as well as library trustee and Metro Vancouver's performance and audit. I bring these well-rounded skills to the table, and when I stood on this stage eight years ago, I pledged to bring my financial experience to the table, and I've achieved that. Championing financial management that has seen us create over $21 million in non-tax revenue to help build the infrastructure that you want and need. I've supported bylaws to create more employment space so we can live and work in our city. On October the 15th, please vote Dennis Marzen, re-election, Coquitlam City Council. Good evening, everyone. My name is Robert Mazzarolo. I'm a lawyer. I've lived in Coquitlam for all my 35 years, and I'm excited to be here tonight. Thank you to the Tri-City Chamber of Commerce for organizing tonight's event. I believe Coquitlam residents deserve a holistic approach to the current and future challenges facing our city. In particular, prioritizing family-oriented housing for families to live and grow and for seniors to continue to thrive in their community. Fostering a vibrant business community to provide local employment opportunities for residents managing city revenues responsibly and efficiently in order to not overburden the taxpayer, expanding our public parks, recreational facilities, and cultural locations to accommodate a growing population, protecting our natural environment for future generations to enjoy, and lastly but certainly not least, ensuring that all peoples of Coquitlam feel welcomed, appreciated, and valued by celebrating Coquitlam's multiculturalism and diversity. I'm looking forward to discussing all these topics, or at least some of them, with all of you tonight. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Cameron McBriar and I'm running for City Council because I love the city. We don't need a big change, but we do need some change. I've grown up here, I went to Centennial, got my degree from physics and SFU, and I now work in renewable energy. I love putting solar panels in people's cabins, boats, RVs, and I think that is something we can bring to Coquitlam, a long-term generational approach to turn Coquitlam into a smart solar city. We can then take everyone in and have electric heat pumps and actually have that resilience when the transmission lines go down. We don't have to rely on the dam. I'm also uh, going to champion transit to go on 24 hours, expanded routes, more service. I've been a graveyard worker. I know how hard it is to get to work at 3 a.m. when you don't have a car. I will champion transit. I will champion bringing diverse uh, ed energy to our city and I'll work tirelessly to bring more business opportunities, including a hotel to Coquitlam. That way we can bring outside people and get that tourism dollar and outside business dollar to Coquitlam. My name is Benjamin Perry. I've lived in Coquitlam for 36 of the past 44 years. I have experience in political advocacy, public engagement, leadership, and governance through my work as a board member for the environmental group Force of Nature and my work as an advocate for healthcare workers with the Health Sciences Association of British Columbia. <clears throat> Climate change and affordable housing are the two most important issues to me. What we build today 
will still be standing for the next 50 years. My platform includes ways our city can reduce carbon emissions, avoid traffic problems, and build housing that meets the needs of Coquitlam residents, including seniors, renters, the homeless, and families. I am truly independent, and on council, I will represent voters and residents fairly. I will champion human rights, anti-discrimination, and democracy. I would be honored to be your voice on City Council. Hello, my name is Leslie Rosa, and I'm running to represent you as a Coquitlam City Councillor on October 15th. I've resided in Coquitlam for over 30 years. Professionally, I'm an educator with the Vancouver School Board. I've been employed as a teacher, English language learner specialist, and a case manager. I've been fortunate enough to work with a lot of families from diverse cultures and backgrounds, preparing me to work with Coquitlam's diverse and multicultural population. I, I, my formal education is from the University of British Columbia. I hold a master's degree in education, bachelor's degree in education, and a bachelor of arts degree. I've served on a number of significant boards. This includes being a trustee for the BC Teachers Pension Plan, the 10th largest pension plan in Canada with assets of over $34 billion, a director for community savings with assets over $800 million, and I've been the secretary treasurer for my local Vancouver Elementary School Teachers Association, one of the largest teachers associations. Urban density is my platform. My name is Zoe Royer. I'm a Tri-Cities resident of 18 years. I worked in healthcare for 22 years and much of it right here in Coquitlam. I also served on Port Moody City Council for 11 years, where I received some of the highest votes in their election history. As an elected leader, I've been determined to restore hope in young people. They deserve a brighter, sustainable future, as we all do, and a community that we love to live in, where they can find a home of their own, put down roots, and still have their grandparents nearby. In a word, my campaign is about love, Love for one another, for our community and the earth that we live on. Love for the peoples that came here before us and for the generations still to come. Love unites us. It never divides us. It gives us the strength and the courage to make a difference. Allow me to be your voice. Vote Zoe on October 15th. Thank you. Before I get started, can I sing a song? <laughs> Usually with the microphone in hand and at such a big stage with such a big, I mean, a crowd, I was singing. But anyway, <clears throat> yeah, my name is Harvey Su. Uh, I'm proud and beyond excited for the opportunity to run for Coquitlam City Council. I have been living in Coquitlam for more than 15 years, and I love Coquitlam. I'm advocating for a better transit system to connect Coquitlam with more communities and opportunities. I have been working hard to push forward the expansion of the unidirectional rush hour only West Coast Express service into a unidirectional, into a bidirectional um, rapid transit that people can enjoy every day. I believe the expansion can be a driving engine for the local economy, helping with housing affordabilities and transform our bedroom community into an integrated city where residents can live, work, and recreate. I also want to attract more family doctors and medical professionals to practice in Coquitlam and reopen Riverview Hospital to address the family doctor shortage. And Good evening. Uh, my name is Ali Tutian. I'm a high school math teacher in Coquitlam. My family and I have lived in this beautiful city for the past 17 years. And my children graduated from Point to secondary, clinical secondary, where I teach. My wife actually is a senior member of Share Society. I'm a doctor of educational technology, and my skills will be in hand and an asset to the future mayor and the council of this city. I'm an education expert, and I will help the residents of Coquitlam to understand their city's climate condition, uh, financial status, 
uh, housing struggle and challenges, and all other factors that you could imagine. I'm standing for a defined infrastructure and, uh, and also uh, for preserving a healthy climate at all costs. This is what the people of Kukitlam ask me for. Have a good night, Anil. Good evening. I'm Terry Towner, and I'm honored to have served two terms on Coquitlam City Council. During the pandemic, for personal wellness, I ran every meter of every street in Coquitlam. I loved this for the challenge, but also I became energized about the opportunity to combine two of my passions, running and <laughs> being solutions-oriented with respect to serving the public. I saw issues such as signage, lighting, illegal dumping, and I got all of it addressed. Seeing our beautifully diverse neighborhoods really became clear to me how important it is to manage our city's growth with protecting and respecting what's here now. And seeing every sliver of Coquitlam just made me even more passionate for this great place we all call home. And that is why I am now running for re-election. I love our city and I love all the people in it. I want what's best for our city. Please vote Terry October 15th. Hello Coquitlam friends and neighbors. My name is Carl Trepanier. I'm running for a seat on city council and I promise I won't sing. I've lived in this wonderful, thank you. <laughs> I've lived in this wonderful city for 26 years. I'm a husband, a father, a community volunteer and a former member of the Canadian Armed Forces. I've owned my own business for 30 years and I relocated it to Coquitlam in 2006. This is where I live, work and play. The key issue facing our city is growth. It shapes our choices of housing, parks, facilities, amenities, and it requires careful thoughts and actions so that we respect our environment. I want to be at the forefront of managing change and growth so that it benefits the current residents of Coquitlam our businesses, and the new friends and neighbors that we will welcome into the community. Some of my goals are to bring more family doctors and healthcare providers to our city, to create rent-to-own housing options to lower barriers to entry for home ownership and ensure that our facilities support the businesses to the level that they need. Please vote for me October 15th. Thank you. Candidates. So we're going to um, move on to the, the uh, audience questions here. Just one quick sec. As I mentioned before, each group of candidates, they'll come up in groups of uh, three and four, and we'll pose the questions from Slido. Uh, and uh, we have randomly selected the groups as follows. So the first group to come up will be uh, our mayoral candidates, uh, Adele, Mark, and Richard. So could please come up to the front. So a reminder to the candidates that you will have 60 seconds to respond to each question. I'll get rid of that. Lawyer versus technology here. It's to stand or sit. That's your preference as long as you uh, project to the microphone. Perfect. So the question from the audience is uh, as follows. What is your top priority for the city of Coquitlam over the next few years and how will you work to address or improve the issue? So we'll start with Richard. Absolutely. Um, some would say my top priority is mental health, but really the biggest, most impactful reality that Coquitlam residents face is still the housing crisis. No question that we are doing more than pretty much any other municipality on a per capita basis. We're generating more rental housing and more affordable rental housing and more below market rental housing than any other community per capita. But we need more communities to do as we're doing. We actually had the housing minister last week praising Coquitlam and asking that other communities start to emulate some of our policies because we can't tackle the housing crisis unless we're all rowing in the same direction.
every municipality and every agency of government all works in the same direction. And we can do that. We can increase the supply of housing. But recall that this province saw 100,000 people move here last year, and the province built enough housing for two-thirds of them. That didn't help, obviously. So we need to continue to work hard, and every municipality has to pull their fair share. Hi, my name is Mark Mavich again, and uh, I'm running on a platform uh, on the premise that the taxes are too high and they keep increasing from what most of the people I've talked to are concerned with is the recent tax increase on utilities. And apparently they have a system that's in place or has been, has been I don't know if it's in function or not, 5% a year for the next 10 years taxes will go up according to what I've re information I've read. So, but uh, nevertheless, that's a huge issue for me, uh, government abuse of funds. And I've been in politics as a lobbyist for quite some time with several governments uh, in the past. I won't say with, with which governments, but um, the fact is, is that the housing crisis is out of control. There's too many customers and not enough uh, residents that are being built or, uh, or can accommodate the immigra immigration that's coming in for the last seven years since Trudeau's been in. And all this done is it's driven houses through the roof, our condos. I was a carpenter for most of my life and I know how the, the market works. And land development is, is uh, a big issue uh, for me too. Thanks, Mark. Adele. Thank you for the question. Uh, two major things that are keeping me up at night, not only what Mr. Stewart just mentioned about housing, but also making sure that City Hall is responsive to every single resident. I mentioned in my opening statement that I've been listening, and I think that that is a superpower for anybody in a position of power and authority, is to listen to the concerns of people. It is no surprise that 25% turnout to local elections because of the fact that I believe we have missed the mark. When it comes to leadership at City Hall, we want to make sure that we're hearing the concerns and the stories of people. From a position of power and public trust as the mayor's position is, there needs to be collaboration. As board chair of Douglas College, we've identified with my colleagues that we needed student housing. Now, that's a city matter. It's a provincial matter. But does post-secondary have an opportunity? Absolutely. The highest and the biggest investment from the provincial government just happened last month with 808 Royal, where we're now going to be welcoming students affording housing on campus. It took me to go to Victoria to meet with Minister Kang and highlight the importance of not only this issue, but also the opportunity. Thank you. Go back to, uh, to Richard Stewart, if you want 30 seconds, just to address any of the comments, any of your colleagues uh, in their comments. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, uh, Douglas College, we've been uh, at, at Douglas College board probably seven times over the last decade, urging them to build uh, some uh, rental housing uh, for students on campus. The housing that was just built or just announced in New Westminster is what we need in Coquitlam as a parcel of land. Unfortunately, it's not local government. We don't own it. It's the province that owns it, and it's the, the college that has to advocate for that, that housing. And it would help solve many of the challenges that we face. Frank, any rebuttal comments? Yes, uh, I've been a carpenter most of my life and the, re the real estate market and the housing market is absolutely out of control and Justin Trudeau has caused it. It's a, you know, a trickle-down effect and there are homeless people everywhere now that we never had 10 years ago and I wonder why that is because we've been sold, the city, country is being sold out and you can't accommodate this many people in domestic and foreign without building a whole lot of residential uh, dwellings and they are only building dwellings that are for people that are buying houses or condos. Thank you, Frank. Adele, 30 seconds. The housing crisis is a crisis. I think as you look across the stage, everybody on this platform is passionate about housing. I think the missed opportunity is not pointing fingers at which level of government can we blame, but rather how do we use that position of power to bring people together, to convene. It was brought up at a barbecue about a couple of weeks ago somebody asking, with the Metro Vancouver mayors, particularly the Tri-City mayors, do you collaborate, do you meet on a regular basis? And the answer that was presented was, we haven't met for seven years. Now, there's seven too long years of issues that need the mayors to actually advocate for these challenges. Thank you very much. That's, unfortunately, that's the time for your group. We'll hopefully have you back in a moment, and we'll bring the next group up now. Uh, Brent Asmussen, Rob Bottas, Phil uh, Buchan, and Ben Craig. Come on up.
And your question, uh, gentlemen, as voted by our friends through Slido, is as follows. How can we make sure that money from people associated with real estate developers doesn't have undue influence on our city government? Brent, we'll start on your end. Well, I think that's been a question going around for a long time. Um, it's one of the reasons the provincial government changed the rules on elections a number of years ago. But I think that was more for a political reason because just recently, Mr. Ibby came out and had a committee with developers and the government, and their responsible for lack of housing was to blame the cities for not doing enough to move housing along, that we were not approving fast enough, we were charging too many fees, and we were creating too many regulations. Mind you, most of the regulations we have are through the province. So we as local government are trying our best, but it never has been the influence that people made it out to be. I take donations from, I don't involve in that, but you need money to run a campaign. I'm, I'm an independent candidate, I'm not a labor endorsed candidate, I don't have a poll card behind me, and the union organization behind me. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, um, echo a bit of what Brent had to say actually. I mean, as it stands right now, the provincial government overhauled our campaign financing regulations. Is it perfect? No. But right now, as an individual, you are allowed to donate up to $1,200. Whether you're a union member, a developer, a business owner, gas station, or an ordinary person, if you have $1,200 to donate to a candidate that you believe in, under the law right now, it's legal. Um, it's been a struggle to raise money. Um, I have to honestly believe that the councillors that are sitting there, their integrity is not for sale. Um, you have, to, you have to be able to work with the development community, you have to be able to work with your community to solve the issues. And if, if good candidates can't raise the money to run, you're, got, you're not going to have a rich and vibrant, diverse pool of candidates to choose from. Thank you. Hello. Oh, hi, Jeff. I would like to say that I pledge to not take any money from developers. And I think the other candidates should do the same thing as well to make it a level playing field. And because it's, it's kind of a, a gray area, right? We don't know if this is having undue influence on the councillors. And I just think that people should declare if they're taking this money during the campaign. And if they're not, if they're making a pledge like me that they're not taking the money, then I think it makes those people look better. And for the, I know it's expensive. I'm having problems actually raising money, but I pledge not to take any money from developers and I'm just taking it from regular people and that's, that's my position. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Richard. Campaign finance is a enormous issue for local politics. Prior to the campaign finance uh, reform rules, there was uh, tens of thousands of dollars being uh, directed to certain candidates and I think that the new campaign finance rules really benefit people who are out there not just to come out every four years and ask for your vote, but are out there every single day trying to work, their, work for their community. Because what you learn in these campaigns, and I've been in a couple of them, is that it's not so much how much money you raise, it's how well people know your name. So I've been trying to get out in the community and work for the community as representative of the Millardville Residents Association today, where we represent 6,000 homes. Prior to that, the Oakdale Neighborhood Association, where we represent that community in Riquitlam. We've had a tremendous track record with our various communities, but it's not about the money. I would push back on the fact that, or the premise that finance, or the, the more you, you get funded, the more chance you have to get elected. I think the answer to that question is to show up every single day, and that's what I've been Thanks, Ben. Now, Brent, 30 seconds for a rebuttal comment or statement, if you wish. We're all here as independent candidates running for council. We're going to do our best. As I said, money from whoever doesn't make an influence in your vote. I've always done what's best for the citizens of Coquitlam for today and tomorrow. I'm a retired bus driver. I know what it's like to see all of you people from all different walks of life, the struggles and the ideas they need. And I think our record in Coquitlam has shown how we've proven to make this a very good city, livable city. And I think people that we had our survey, 97% of the people value the quality of life in Coquitlam as good. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Rob, 30 seconds. In my last campaign four years ago, in this campaign, all the money I've raised has come from individuals that I've known and built relationships with over my 44 years in the community. 
but one to touch one point on what Ben mentioned. Um, sadly, though, it is about money. We have a civic mail out that for some candidates, whether it be due, due to lack of opportunity or lack of planning, that civic mail out can be a barrier for candidates participating because when people get their package, they think, well, these are the indoor, these are the candidates that are running, not realizing there may be individuals that couldn't afford to get in the mail out. So as much as it isn't about money, money. Thanks, Philip. Um, yeah, I would say it is money is important for all campaigns because there are so many expenses that we have to do, like Rob mentioned, the mail out signs and advertising and everything. But still, I think that there should be no developer money in, in civic campaigns because it will make it more um, transparent and people will know what is happening. And Ben. Thank you. I'd like to put a finer point on that idea of campaign uh, financing. Uh, if you look at the last election, 2018, there was various, the, the, the metric I look at is dollars per vote. So how much did you raise divided by how many votes you got? That equals how many dollars per vote it, uh, that, that, you, that was directed towards your vote. And we went from over $4 with Steve Kim to the last and, and, and most efficient uh, dollars per vote was myself, 77 cents per vote. So again, I would push back on the fact that you need lots of... Thanks, guys. That's it for this session. And our next four are Matt DeJohnlick, Craig Hodge, and Steve Kim. Now, your Slido question, gentlemen, is uh, as follows. As a Chinese Canadian who's lived here in, for decades, I have seen an increase in anti-Asian racism in my community. What will you do to address this, as well as increase understanding that the Chinese Communist Party may not represent the values of Chinese Canadians? Matt, we'll start with you down there. Well, I think it's a great question and one that we've been dealing with over the last few years of the pandemic. I mean, we, we know we've seen a rise of anti-Asian hate, and I, I want to call out really the, the amazing, uh, some of the amazing Chinese community members we've had in the Tri-Cities that have put together an anti-Asian hate group uh, and put together a latest dumpling festival, held rallies, and really brought the community together to combat this kind of hatred, which is frankly unacceptable in my Coquillum. Um, and I think we can all agree with that. Um, in, in terms in terms of moving forward, um, we, you know, this is where Coquitlam needs to continue uh, promoting some of our diverse multicultural events. And I think there's a role to play, and I, I know this is getting a little out of the city scope, but with education with kids, like starting young, just really promoting the idea that we live in a multicultural community, that hate has no place here in Coquitlam, and that this is really, this is a Canadian value that we all agree with. Thank you, Craig. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, really, really disappointed. I, you know, when I came to Coquitlam and moved here, this was a very different looking community, but it is today. Today we've become a multicultural community, and that's a real opportunity for us to share in the customs, share in celebrations, and I think that we're a richer community for that. Today, almost 50% of the people in Coquitlam uh, were not born to an English-speaking family, and I think that that makes us all uh, a better community. I'm really pleased with, uh, with how this community has embraced uh, multiculturalism. Uh, the Dumpling Festival just recently was held. It was one of our most successful festivals that we've put together. Our multicultural community is, is doing really good work and, and I think that uh, as, as a community we're richer for this and I think that we also have to make sure that we, we all together stand up against this kind of uh, racism and, uh, and some of that may involve uh, bringing in uh, RCMP and, uh, and you know when, when the cases are there that, uh, that we have to step up I think but I think the most important thing to do is to stand together. Thanks Craig. Steve? Yes. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, well certainly this one uh, hits home deeply with me. Uh, someone who was born here in the Lower Mainland and raised in Coquitlam. Uh, certainly our demographics and our city has grown into a very multi multicultural city. Um, I've spent the better part of my adult life working to build bridges and create mutual understanding. So when you see these acts happening, it really hits home for me. Uh, so for me, you know, certainly I've been speaking out. Uh, if you look on my Facebook and on Council when Asian Month, uh, Heritage Month hits, I'm out there speaking, and anything that happens on, uh, as they happen during the, uh, I guess every day, uh, I know that everyone is out there denouncing this acts, or these types of acts. 
to bring it back to mutual understanding, I certainly, just as uh, Councillor Hodge mentioned, uh, the Dumpling Festival is one that hit home for me. Uh, it saw it as an opportunity to build on the message of anti-Asian hate, but also to create mutual understanding. So these are the types of things that I would love to continue to do. Thank you. Thanks, Paul Lambert. Thank you. Yeah, clearly one of the worst things that happened in Coquitlam in the last five, four years was that anti-Asian and anti-Chinese uh, racism that, that we experienced. Um, I, first of all, I want to acknowledge the Chinese and the greater Asian community for the grace and strength with which they handled it. Um, I, as someone like myself, I can't even imagine uh, what the community and members go through. So uh, again, the, the grace and strength. Um, for me, the key is awareness. Uh, thankfully, we have wonderful multicultural settings in our schools, but and they're doing great work in our schools. We need to make sure we have explicit awareness campaigns at schools and the city has a specific role as well because most of our population isn't in school at a given time. So an awareness campaign across the city would be one of my uh, key solutions. Um, and just a couple last things. Our Chinese community actually rep represents 26% of residents in Coquitlam. So they're a wonderful and large part of our community. And last but not least, I want to acknowledge Harvey Su, our only candidate of Chinese descent, and Steve Kim, because uh, they would have been the, the only two people on the stage tonight that would have had to deal with this. So thank you to the, both those gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks. Matt, uh, to you for 30 second rebuttal, if you wish. Yeah, I guess maybe I could just use this time to highlight the, the, the more work that we need to do around equity and diversity at large here in the city. Um, I mean, we, we know still that this is, a, this is an incredibly diverse community, but often when we look at the council table, it still doesn't quite reflect how diverse the, the community actually is. Um, we have a, an indigenous population in Coquitlam. We have a considerable Chinese, Korean, and Iranian uh, population. And, and one thing I, I do want to say, too, is we clearly made straight great strides. I mean, we have such a more diverse slate of candidates here running in this election than we have in the past, and I think that speaks to the work um, we've been doing at the city and in the community. Thanks, Matt. Craig, 30 seconds? Yeah, thank you. I want to build on what uh, Matt said, and that is certainly uh, the city's policy towards equity, diversity, and inclusion. Earlier, we heard uh, one of the candidates criticize us for a hiring that we made during the pandemic. One of that positions was a manager of equity, diversity, and inclusion, because even coming out of that pandemic, this city and our council recognized that that was an important hire and that we want to move this community forward. And the other one was uh, a piece of uh, somebody to look after Indigenous recon uh, reconciliation. So this is a city City Council recognizes that we need to move forward in this area, and we are, and we're doing that with the support of our community. Thanks, Craig. Steve? Yes, uh, thank you, Councillor Hodge, for uh, mentioning those uh, two themes for our city. But I also see a longer-term strategy as we build out. So we have uh, incredible cultural hub potential. Uh, from the Korean community, the Chinese community, the Persian community, uh, and also based on our, the heritage of the French community here. We can bring together stakeholders, business, small businesses, and others, entertainment, however it might be, and we can actually create and foster some understanding over the long term by getting everyone involved in our community and reaping the benefits of opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Um, I think one thing I love to highlight is just more and more events that are not only multicultural but focused on one culture and then others from others, other cultures can go to those events. So uh, just last weekend, the Tri-City Ch Tri Chinese Community Society hosted an event at the library for all the candidates. And it was wonderful and I was taken aback by the energy and the charisma in the room. And we need more events like that where people of different backgrounds are coming together. So the Dumpling Festival was mentioned, but I'd love to see more of those opportunities. So not just we need those multicultural ones, but we also need uh, more narrow ones that other cultures can come and share and learn. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. That's the end of this session. The next group, uh, Sean, Trish, Dennis, and Robert, come on up. Well, if any of you need a refill on your water, just hold your cup up in the air and we'll figure it out for you. So folks, your, que your question is as follows. West Coast Express expansion to all day two-way service will bring benefits and housing affordability and jobs creation. Will you support and lead this initiative? So uh, Sean, we'll start with you. Yes, um, I support the West Coast Express expansion. Uh, however, it's, uh, uh, when you look at the jurisdiction, you have to talk to your um, uh, CN Rail and their schedule and their demand. However, um, my uh, platform is bringing Medical City by uh, 
um, bringing medical and IT industry because we can live and walk in the same city so that all the money stay in the city and then we circulate or uh, support the local uh, businesses. So uh, I do support, however, uh, my platform is bringing medical city in Coquitlam. Thank you, Trish. Thank you. I believe the question should be, will I advocate for it? Support, yes, I support it. But our tax dollars that we have do not allow us to budget for that and to be able to say, yeah, we're going to go for it. But yes, we need to advocate for it. But we need to work with the upper levels, upper levels of government so that we can say, yes, the Tri-Cities is growing and we have more population. And the more we get people out of their cars onto trains, the better we do when it comes to our sustainability goals. So yes, I support it. Thank you, Trish. Dennis? Great, thank you. I don't think you're going to find anybody that's going to stand on stage and say they don't support it. We support increasing transit options to our region. There's obviously a number of hurdles associated with the expansion of the West Coast Express. Sean's touched on some of them. Um, but the key is ensuring that we advocate for the enhancement for transit, whether that be bus services, uh, more SkyTrain services, or the West Coast Express, and ensure that we're creating the environment where business can open here as well. So it's a two-way street. It's not people leaving their homes in the morning to go to work elsewhere, but we're creating the environment where people are getting off the Sky Train at Central City. They're getting at, at uh, Coquitlam Central. They're getting off the Sky Train at Lincoln, and they're finding employment right there. As, as we look and create these uh, environments where entertainment districts and employment districts, we've got the opportunity with this, and we need to capitalize on the infrastructure that we have in place already because it's cheaper and more effective than trying to rebuild more. Thank you, Dennis. Robert? Uh, yes, uh, unequivocal yes when it comes to supporting the expansion of the West Coast uh, Express. Uh, there's so many positive externalities uh, when it comes to alternative uh, modes of transportation. Reduces pollution, reduces congestion, and ultimately it's a cheaper alternative to get to and from work and to and from uh, your daily activities. So the answer for me would be yes. But my idea, and, and just to touch on what Dennis said, is hopefully one day uh, in the near future that the West Coast Express could be used to bring people into Coquitlam so that if we grow our economy, if we grow our cities-based economy, that people will want to come here to work to help uh, supplement our city revenues, to help provide employment opportunities, uh, to help um, you know, our local small business owners have more patrons. So ideally in the future, the ex uh, expansion of the West Coast Express, yes, but let's see if we can bring them here. Thanks. And Sean, 30-second rebuttal if you wish. Since we are about to face economic crisis, energy crisis for at least a decade, uh, we need to cut down energy costs in general as much as possible. Green and public transportation will be the key to solve this problem. I will turn Coquitlam into a walkable and barrier-free city for e-scooters, cyclists, strollers, and people using walkers, canes, and wheelchairs. As well, I will work together with the city and council to discuss and initiate further extension of the Evergreen Line to meet the growing needs of our city's population. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Trish, 30 seconds. Earlier I talked about advocating for it, but the other thing that we need to do is to make sure that that last mile is taken care of. If we want people to get on the trains, they ought to be able to find a way to come from Westwood Plateau, to come from Back Mountain in order to come to the train. So we as a city, what we can do is to look at how we can do that last mile and get people so that they don't have to get in their cars to get there. Otherwise, when they get in, they're going all the way. So we definitely need to, to work on how we can improve that. Thank you, Dennis. Great, thanks. Again, there's not much to rebut here because we are in agreement. But I think what's, uh, I'll bring an interesting lens to this. My, my son moved out of the home just recently after being raised in a fairly car-centric environment. He looked and said, I want a condo and it's got to be near SkyTrain. I don't want to have to rely on a car. There's opportunities out there for car share services, for scooters, for bikes. I don't want to rely on a car. He's a finance major, so he says, I don't want to spend the money on a car. It's a waste. The transit's there. Let's use it. And that's the opportunities that present today. Thanks, Dennis. Robert? Yeah, I don't disagree with what the other uh, candidates have said here So, with this question. So I'll just to touch on a, uh, the previous question about developer donations. Um, 
previous candidates said that, uh, you know, a lot of them said that they do not take developer donations. I don't either. Um, that it does not affect their decision making on city council. Uh, I believe them. However, there is an extra layer that needs to be done here. That it's not just that it affects them, that they need to be perceived and believed to be impartial. And if you take do uh, donations from developers, that perce perception and belief may not be there. Thank you very much. Thanks to you four. That's it for this session. And next, we have Cameron, Benjamin, Leslie, and Zoe. Come on up. Oh, this is a good one. So candidates, the question is this. What will you do to better protect our mature trees, which are essential for the livability of our neighborhoods and coping with climate change effects such as heat waves and intense rainstorms? So we will start at this end at this time. Surprise. <laughs> Thank you very much for the question. Um, I, I think that as we are plagued by atmospheric rivers, heat domes, and any other manner of the effects of climate change, we really have to get serious about tree pr protection and also tree planting. The magnificent species that we see in uh, Riverview and around the community, these trees have been growing there for, in some cases, hundreds of years. We are so lucky to have them. It, it, the, the power of a tree um, that really absorbs the carbon in the atmosphere, that cleans the air, is something that we are dependent on uh, moving into the future. So working on the Climate Action Committee with Metro Vancouver for the past three years, this is something that we're looking at. But it's also the planting. And uh, Mississauga sets a really good example. They have a goal to plant one million trees. They're almost halfway there. They have uh, a bit more. Thank you. Thanks, Zoe. Leslie. Thank you, Leslie Rosa. Yes, I want to uh, talk about this in terms of protection of parks. I'll use Monday Park as an example. If you go to Monday Park, it has a wonderful canopy. And during the recent heat dome, we've seen how important that these canopies are. We need to plant more trees. I mean, the science is that uh, research indicates that planting more trees absorbs a lot of carbon. And um, this is something we need to keep doing. We can develop a plan. I know the city right now has planted numerous trees and has a plan to plant more. But I think that's something that we have to continue on with. And I think protection of trees is extremely important. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. Yeah, thank you, Benjamin Perry. One of the first political issues that uh, came to my mind as a child was the removal of trees. As I watched from my balcony, uh, empty lots being with the being detreed in Coquitlam in order to make way for housing. Now, housing is important, so we need to be able to do that. Uh, but we have to find a way to provide housing while still uh, protecting the important tree canopy in our city, which provides cooling in the summer and carbon sequestration. We can't replace mature trees with small trees that we're replanting. Protection is first, but we also have to have a sensible policy that doesn't get in the way of people redeveloping housing. We can have buildings and trees side by side. It's possible, and we need to protect the forest that we still have in the urban setting. Thank you. Thank you. Cameron. Well, to touch on what they said, the canopy is quite important. We need to plant more trees. We have a robust park environment in this city, and we need to make sure that education comes first when people start exploring our parks so they know when they go into our parks that they're not going to damage anything. We should also go after people who cut down trees in their households and go after to get the bylaw officer to really find the people who cut down trees that aren't necessarily need to be cut down. The canopy is the important part. Plant more trees in the heavy concrete jungle areas because that's where the heat is really radiating and that's generally where the underprivileged tend to live. Thank you. Thanks. Zoe, 30 seconds if you wish. Okay, great. Thank you. I think cities play a huge role in this because 80% of Canadians live in urban centers. 
And, you know, that's where we can really make lofty changes. I talked about youth earlier, and I think an amazing collaboration would be between SD43 and the city of Coquitlam with youth representatives from middle and secondary schools that are tasked with the, the Student Advisory Sustainability Committee because our youth will help us make courageous changes, and that is the thing that is needed. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Or, <laughs> thanks, Zoe. Leslie. Thank you. Um, I know we're talking about canopies, but I think it's larger than this. We also need to support projects in our community around environmental issues and support initiatives as well. But the key factor is, is to also have budgetary support within the budget within City Hall. Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention is we can do so much more at City Hall. I know City Hall recently has charging stations, and I think those sorts of things need to continue on within our city. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, Benjamin, 30 seconds. Benjamin Perry. Uh, yes, uh, I think it's really important that we have a policy uh, that addresses how we build our city and the buildings and the infrastructure around it and make sure that it's the best for the environment, including urban forests and also looking at the building materials and processes that we use to make sure that there's not undue carbon emissions and destruction of our forests in British Columbia and around the world. Thank you. Thanks. Cameron. As Lily touched on earlier, it should be a partnership with education and we should get our children learning at a very young age. We can plant greenhouses and community gardens in some of our schools. We can have bee boxes and have that environmental progress take place. We need to educate. They will then protect the trees in the future going forward. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, you four. And our last, our last foursome is Harvey, Allie, Terry, and Carl. Carl, I feel like I've been standing in front of you all night. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> All right, your question is this. What is your stand on the two proposed expansion projects, Parkland Biofuels and Fortis BC LNG, which will release in tons of carbon emissions per year? So Carl, let's start on your end. Um, I can't say I'm intimately familiar with the biofuel project, but the LNG project I know has been contentious since it was introduced. I think we need to look at it on a global scale. LNG, I believe, we can use to supplant some of the dirtier um, forms of heating in developing countries. And so if we can export our LNG, if we can use those to then wean other countries off, then we're at the benefit. In the meantime, what I would love to see is that we take every dollar that we get from programs like this, every tax dollar that comes in gets directed into clean energy development, research and development, into building clean energy models, into building clean energy equipment, and then dispersing it out into the community. We can take this, we can use it as a force for change and for good for our environment by helping com uh, other countries to lean off, wean off of dirty uh, energy and also to getting clean energy distributed through our country. Thanks. Ali? I'm an environmentalist. I'm proud to be a member of the Burke Mountain in uh, Environmentalist and Nationalist. Uh, I believe that you know my answer already. We need to educate people. And we also need still to educate ourselves, learn from other countries. Uh, when people believe on the projects, then believe it, then we can be in a better situation to um, plan and to enforce the plan. But if we don't know the answers, then we are all vulnerable. The best thing is to research, check. I think that the city and the government are supposed to provide a better opportunity for the people to get to know the factors affecting these decisions, and that's what I'm standing for. Thanks, Ali. Terry? Thank you very much for the question. I didn't quite hear it. It's two projects on biofuels. Sure. The first one is uh, Parkland Biofuels, and the second was Florida Species LNG Project. Well, I just returned from UBCM, it was all of last week, and I had some amazing, energizing uh, conversations with the folks from Fortis. I used to work there for 17 years, so I know quite a few of the people. And they had a lot of enthusiasm for their upcoming projects. One of them is involving hydrogen. I don't know if that's the Parkland one you're referring to, but I think what's really important is we have to show that there is hope for our future. Uh, Mayor Stewart talks about mental health, it affects all of us. 
But I understand that a lot of our young people um, today, they feel a bit overwhelmed with our climate and climate change and sort of the, the, the changes in the weather and it's gloom and doom. And so I think we need to embrace clean energy product projects. We have to show that there is options out there. It's not gonna happen overnight. We have to inspire hope that we are looking as leaders. We have to advocate for this research and keep moving forward. Thanks, Terry Harvey. Uh, we are fighting cl uh, climate change, and I think we need to move to clean energy. So I'm very glad to see uh, the Coquitlam City has approved its uh, first environmental uh, sustainability plan, ESP, with the goal to uh, reduce the uh, GHG, uh, GHG, uh, GHG emission levels and achieve the uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. I think that's the, uh, the direction we need to go. Um, thank you. Thanks, Harvey. Yeah. Carl, 30 seconds. Could we sneak another question in instead of... Uh... Nope. <laughs> 20 seconds. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, I'd just like to reiterate, I feel that uh, any dollar we make from the sales of fossil fuels from any development in that way should be sent back directly. Uh, and I think our senior governments should put that into their, uh, into their budgeting tools and say, every dollar that we get from LNG, we get from any of our energy sales, will go into uh, developing green energy. Thanks. Ali? I go back to what Adele Gamar mentioned, that we need to get closer to the people. What was the last time anybody at home received a survey from Coquitlam City and Council? Don't get me wrong, these are my friends. So, but I believe that we need to hear people better than before. Give them data, ask their opinion. That's what I think that people are asking me when I'm talking and knocking on doors. They say, never, never come to us, nobody ask us any question. I, I believe that we need to count on people better than before. A lot, of, a lot of people are having a lot of knowledge that they can share with us. Thanks, Terry. I'm very proud of our environmental sustainability plan and I think that we are doing a lot of things in the city to mitigate climate change with the uh, stream side protection, the EV charging, uh, micro mobility. Um, there's a curbside giveaway event this weekend. That's something I brought to the council table. That's just to keep more things out of the landfill. We have anti-idling bylaw in place now, which is also something that I brought forward. So we can keep doing what we can do to protect our environment and value it and show that there's hope for the future and keep embracing green energy. Thanks, Harvey. So we need to pr uh, protect our, our uh, environments. So we need to attract more um, economic, uh, green technology to Coquitlam, like uh, solar panels, heat pumps, um, electric uh, vehicles, and stuff like that. And I, I totally agree with uh, Ali's uh, opinion. We need a consultation with our residents and ask for their opinions on this kind of important issue. Thank you. Thanks. So that's the end of our first round of the, uh, the four by four questions. We're gonna circle back and do a second set of questions. The difference this time is we won't have a chance to do the 30 second rebuttal round. So that'll allow us hopefully to get through everybody one more time. So if I can get the mayoral candidates to pop up to the front again and. Oh. <laughs> This question will either be very difficult or very easy. So Adele, we'll start with you. And the question is this, as a representative or as the mayor of the city of Coquitlam, what will be your superpower? <laughs> Other than my wife and five girls, um, I think the superpower of any person in a position of authority is to listen and to find ways to collaborate. The city of Coquitlam has a, a growing number of seniors we are not a designated age-friendly city, a designation that's designated by the BC um, Ministry of Health. We have neglected our youth for far too long. 30% of residents of Coquitlam are under the age of 24. We have not created spaces for young people to feel like they belong so they can stop looking at their screens and look up and connect into other people's eyes. When I decided to run, I met with Chief Ed Hall to encourage me to run. I wanted to hear him. Would he endorse me as a mayoral candidate? And he said to me, Adele, we have never had a mayoral candidate or a candidate at all to come and ask us permission. City to nation partnership is critical. It is part of the important role of listening. And I believe that is important and a, a pivotal point when you're looking for a position as a mayor of a city. And finally, mental health. Thanks. <laughs> You'll have a chance in your, uh, your closing remarks. Thanks. Mark? Yes, hi. Um, like I said, I've lobbied for uh, several 
politicians in the past for quite some time, and uh, I have contributed to getting certain politicians elected, and unfortunately none of them worked out the way I wanted. The main issue right now is the environment. The environment is being thrashed. Construction is a big problem because they cut down all the trees to, big, to build from the square footage. And uh, being in the business my whole life, it's, it's absolutely disgusting how there's no um, culpability for the, for the environment or trees. And uh, the, the example is of what they've done in Monday Park. They've cut down about 200 trees that most of them were healthy and calling it a safety program for the wind, wind storms when most of the trees either snap in the middle or come right out from the roots in the park because they're very big trees. But, um, you know, as far as this governor or this mayor and the, and the council saying that they're, uh, they're uh, environmentally friendly, well, I find that quite, uh, quite concerning considering what I see. And uh, the other issue is, is the taxes that um, have been going up quite consistently. And it needs to be, uh, there needs to be a cap put on the taxes. And, uh, Thanks, uh, Mark. Richard. Thank you very much. Um, Actually, I think Adele, I agree with his first one, because absolutely you have to listen in this job, it's about that, but mine will be the ability to have empathy. Uh, those who know the story of, uh, I'm glad my wife's here with, with us, because our family went through the realities of the gaps of mental health uh, treatment in this province. We saw the challenges that families can face. And you, re you really come to a better understanding and an ability to listen better when you've faced those kinds of realities and uh, you know we're lucky our daughter is doing much better now she's graduated and is a psychiatric nurse but the challenges that so many other families face from mental health and from all kinds of other realities um, we need to listen as a community we need to do what we can and i commit to continuing to do that thank you that's it for this round so the next Now bear with me because these may not be in the same order that we did last time. So the next group is going to be Steve, Paul, Robert. Is that the same as last time? No. Steve, Paul, Robert, and... No, we don't have Mo. Okay, just the three of you. Come on up. Pardon me? No, yeah, yeah, sorry. No, because that'll throw me off. I'm very simple-minded, and I can't. <laughs> but you still only get one minute. The question is this, and Robert, we'll start with you. What are your plans to support seniors in Coquitlam? Great question. Uh, first is to consult with seniors as much as possible. What do you guys, or what do they need? What, what are they looking for for the type of housing, for the type of activities that they want, for what they want to do in their uh, spare time? Consulting with them uh, repeatedly as often as possible to get their ideas. That's where you get the best information from, the source. Second thing, after a couple ideas that you know, I would put forward is uh, senior focused housing in the neighborhoods and in the communities that they already live in so they don't have to feel that they're being displaced from the community that they helped build. Uh, it's a source of safety, it's a source of familiarity for seniors. Uh, we want seniors here, we, we value seniors here in Coquitlam, and obviously the time and the effort they had in building our communities and building the communities that now I'm a part of, uh, we need to respect and we need to make sure that they continue to be a part of those communities moving forward. Thanks. Uh, Steve. So thank you. Um, I guess uh, first off, uh, for myself, uh, over the past two and a half years, I've been delivering uh, regularly to to our seniors through the the city's seniors meals program, um, and it's been a very important program not only to reach out to seniors during the pandemic, but now it's morphed into a program to help with self isolation. So meaningful services on the ground like that, I think, are very important. Uh, certainly seniors housing. I'm proud that the city is also working towards more affordable seniors housing. We have two projects that are looking for partnerships to build some homes for our seniors. Um, and I would like to take it further. Uh, I've been talking about the cultural aspects of things and certainly cultural appropriate seniors housing where the cuisine, language, meet the residents, I think goes a long way to providing the services for our community. And uh, those are things that I would be looking for uh, moving forward, um, especially for my mom and dad right there. Like, no, sorry to, to call you out on your age, mom and dad. Um, and I guess I'll say for myself. Thanks, Paul. I'm going to let my parents off the hook. They're not quite seniors yet. 
Um, getting there, though. Getting there. Um, no, uh, on a more serious note, uh, these are some really important issues and some that are really near and dear to my heart. So uh, the number one thing, I think we need to listen more to seniors. Uh, I've found a lot of instances in public input um, opportunities. Uh, older voices are actually being written off, and I think that's just plain wrong. Uh, one thing I'd like to highlight is I've seen the last four years, when it comes to public input, we shifted online. So I think we need more paper versions. Um, in one campaign, I actually drove to a bunch of residents' homes. Uh, not trying to tout that for what I did, but to raise awareness that that is a need in our community. So more paper-based input for seniors. Uh, number two, one of the worst things I've seen in the last four years is the pressure that older homeowners have been under from realtors and developers in Coquitlam. It's absolutely awful. Um, I have heard horror story after horror story, even some gentlemen in their 80s and 90s crying at their front door, no exaggeration, because they've been hounded by realtors and developers in areas that our current council have rezoned too quickly. And I'll come to my third point and then the last. Great. Thanks, Paul. That's it for this group. Thanks, guys. Next group, we have Leslie, Ali, Rob, Bodice, and uh, Trish. All right. Uh, Trish, we'll start with you. What opportunities are there for adding green technology in the city? Oh, wow. I love that question. Being that I am an entrepreneur in residence at SFU, and I get to work with the new, uh, with, the, with the brilliant minds that I at SFU that are looking into all the innovative technology. We definitely cannot ignore innovative technology when we're talking about our lives for tomorrow. We're talking about the, the environmental social governance. We're talking about sustainability. We cannot do that without green technology. So I think as a city, we have been doing things one way for so many years. But now is the time that we need to be innovative and we need to be creative in how we think. And we recently had a program here in Coquitlam where we had a competition for innovative minds to come in and do their projects or pitch their projects to say, this is what I would like to do you know, to, in order to improve things in the city. And definitely we need to provide that space as, uh, as, a, as a city and as a, as a governance body so that we can um, provide that space to be creative and innovative. Great, thank you. Leslie. Yes, with the green technology, I think it's extremely important that the city adopts green, green technology as a uh, way to operate the city and city hall and other aspects of city hall. I also think it's important if we're going to be looking at green technology initiatives that we're very serious about having a budget item for it because we can always talk about lots of different projects and green innovations, but I think it's important that we're actually looking at how we're going to fund that within a budget structure. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Ali? I'm in favor of uh, solar panels. Believe me, if the price is right, I promise in here right at, at front of my dear Senator Robinson that I'm going to put on my roof. So then do it then. I think we should stay open to uh, the possibilities out there. And it starts from uh, schools as well. Let the students know what is important. They take it home. They talk to their fam families, and families are even more open to um, understand that, hey, things are being changing. So we need to, again, in this area, go a little bit of education, but we need to stay open to uh, the possibilities. Again, it's going to be a lot of research. Again, we can take a model of other countries and to see what they have done, uh, because they may or may not work for us. Uh, so we have to study a lot about it before we make final decision. And of course, we need some money for it. Thanks, Ali. Rob? Yeah, I think for encouraging green technologies, um, you've, got to be sm I mean, you've got to be smart about it. Um, you have to work in partnership with both hydro, the provincial government, because the city can't afford to, to pay the cost themselves. Perhaps there's incentive programs offered to the provincial government or through places such as hydro. Um, we also need to look at experts in the field to see what kind of green technology makes sense in our community. Obviously, you know, uh, nuclear power will not work in Coquitlam, and neither will run a river, but I know there are technologies out there that we can bring to our city. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, you four. Our next group is uh, Sean, Cameron, Zoe, and Terry. All right. 
The question is this. What are you going to do if you're elected to increase opportunities for affordable housing so that those that are raised in the city can stay and bring their families? So Sean, we'll start with you. Yeah, on the issue of affordable housing, I take an unconventional approach. Modern technology like mass timber construction is a resolution for affordable housing. Encouraging the implementation of this new technology in the construction industry will help lower property prices. Also, this technology is known to be more sustainable by producing less construction waste. Thanks. Cameron. I'll look into finding any reasonable means of lowering city property taxes, finding ways of bringing that down, making it more affordable for the regular homeowner so that they can invest more into the city, have more of that money, generate revenue, so there's more business, more residents can actually afford to live here by having better paying jobs. If you have more better paying jobs, then you can afford to live in the city and hopefully you have better tax dollars to afford the land. Yeah. Good, thanks Cameron. Uh, Terry. Thank you for the question. I have a 20-year-old daughter and an 18-year-old son, and I really and truly hope they can stay in Coquitlam, or at least here in the Tri-Cities, stay local. It breaks my heart that there's ads recruiting young people to move to Alberta because it's cheaper there. Uh, I collect um, things for refugee families, and just in the last couple of weeks, I've taken furniture from families, young people moving to Alberta. And so that breaks my heart. And I am going to keep, um, we have an affordable housing strategy that we implemented in 2015. And the city now has more rental and more affordable housing in stream than we had for decades prior. Uh, it's a living, breathing document, so we keep adjusting it and making amends to it. I will keep advocating for very efficient land use. My sister's subdividing a lot in pe Peachland right now, and she's building um, backyard houses for each of her sons, for my nephews. That might be a more creative way to use our land in the future so our families can stay together and stay here in Coquitlam. Thanks, Terry. Zoe? Yes, thank you very much. I think that the key to delivering affordable housing in our communities is partnerships. It's about partnerships with the provincial government. We actually have Selena Robinson sitting in the audience and when it was her portfolio, she was delivering um, unprecedented quantities of housing uh, in our region. So, um, but partnerships with provincial government, with nonprofit groups, it's about cities using levers, planning levers, about the reduction of development cost charges, about fast tracking applications, um, about really looking at where you might consider inclusionary zoning and, uh, and there's, there's all of those things available. Thank you. Thank you, folks. And next we have uh, Philip, Craig, and Carl, a group of three. By the way, we are pretty much on schedule. You guys are amazing at respecting the time clock. We all appreciate it. Uh, OK, here's the question. Only four women are on stage. How do you plan to promote engagement by groups that are underrepresented in our institutions? Who wants to start with that one? Carl? Yeah. Thanks. That's a, an absolutely wonderful question as a father of two daughters. Um, you know, I believe that my two kids should be able to look up and to see themselves represented. I think we need to start very, very young. We need to engage our young people. We need to show them how our democracies work. We need to engage them in voting in uh, the schools. We need to show them the importance of everything that we do in municipal, provincial, and federal governments. If we can instill in them that sense that it is an important thing to do, it is a worthwhile endeavor, then I believe they will follow into those pursuits and you will see it open up more and more. We need some leaders. We do need members of our LGBTQ uh, community to come forward. We need people of color. We need people with disabilities to come forward. And I would just love to see that happen so they could blaze the trail and then we can follow in and educate our younger people to uh, respect that, uh, that life. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. Craig? Okay, thank you. I was actually hoping for the senior question, given that I'm the only one here that counts as a senior, but... Uh, <laughs> 
But, uh, you know, one of the other things that we are trying to do is we are trying to encourage more women to, uh, to run. And uh, this was something that our council looked at uh, this year. We uh, brought in a couple of policies uh, to make it easier for uh, women that uh, might have to take a leave of absence for, uh, for you know, for having children and other things. So we, we are aware that we're trying to bring down the barriers. I wish there were more women running here. I'm pleased that we four people have stepped up to do it. But as, as Carl said, we also have to make sure that we have a wide diversity of, of candidates that uh, run. And I'm pleased to see that we are, we are getting there. If you look at a picture of the city council, uh, you, know, six, well, you know, 60 years ago, or even 20 years ago, it was very different. It was unusual to have even one woman on, on council. So I think our, our, our council is becoming more representative of the community that we serve, but I think it's important that we reach out to all members of our community, uh, whether it is uh, the LGBTQ community, whether it's uh, women, whether it's seniors, we need more people. Thanks, Greg. Philip? Uh, hello, yeah, this is a really good question. I really like this question. I have worked on campaigns of many women and helped them get elected, and we just have to make it easier for them to get involved in politics. And I really believe that um, we have to um, help them fund their campaigns and make them feel comfortable in the council spaces. Sometimes it's like an old boys club. I'm, I'm an, my, I guess I'm an old boy myself. <laughs> but we have to make it more comfortable in the council chambers for the women to feel free to express their opinions and not be... Um, sometimes bullied or something like that by other councillors. It has to be a diverse space for all people. Thank you. Our next group is uh, Brent, uh, Benjamin Perry and Harvey. All right, our Slido question is, million dollar homes are only affordable if you split the cost between multiple families. This is the reason for duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, etc. Our zoning currently bans these forms of housing throughout most of the city. Do you support rezoning as a means to fight the affordability crisis? Harvey, start with you. I think I would definitely uh, support this kind of idea. I think the, uh, um, right now we're encouraging um, high densities around the uh, sky trains, rapid transit, but we also need to uh, encourage uh, gentle densities uh, without um, seriously impact the uh, environment, uh, the uh, neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Benjamin. Thank you. Yes, um, this is a very important solution for housing affordability. Uh, I was knocking on doors on Regan Street in Coquitlam and talking to residents, and I talked to not one, not two, but three different families that had adult children at home, and they had a lot that could have the capacity for four units. And every one of, all three of those families told me that they wanted to redevelop into a fourplex, but the zoning would not allow them to. I, I would advocate at the city hall level, at the city council, to expand Coquitlam's housing choices program beyond the southwest corner of the city to cover the entire city. Thank you. Thank you. Brent. Well, thank you very much. On council, we do have a housing choices program, which allows for lots to be split into either the size lot for three small homes, four small homes on the lots. We have worked hard at laneway housing and other types of small types of housing in our city. So we are stepping in and trying to create as many choices for people and different forms of housing as we can. So we are working on that. We've been done that in Millardville. You have to be careful as you move forward on these type of initiatives to make sure that the, the, the community that you're doing this in, it works and fits for everybody, that there's not a overcrowding of people with parking and everything in these areas. So when we start the program in Housing Choice, we took an area, we wanted to see how successful it's gonna be before we move it to the rest of the community and around. But we do have a program for multiple choices of housing. And the other thing we did in Coquitlam is we put a cap on the size of housing of 5,500 square feet, nothing over it. We got away from those large six, seven, 11,000 square foot houses. Okay. Thanks, Brent. Thank you, guys. And our last uh, group before we get into uh, the candidates' closing remarks will be Ben, Matt, and Dennis.
Okay, Ben, we'll start down on your end, and the question is this. If you are elected or re-elected, what unique initiative or idea would you champion to make Coquitlam a better place to live? Ben. Thank you for the question. I think I bring unique attributes to my new position on council in two ways. First of all, I'm a financial planner. I've been doing that for over 20 years. I help families budget and save for retirement. My view is that our local government should budget in the same way as Coquitlam families do. That's, in that way, when they're looking at their budget for the year and they see a deficit, they make adjustments. They don't lean on us, the taxpayer, to make up the difference every time. Number two, I've been deeply involved in the communities where I've raised my kids. First in Oakdale in the Briquitlam area, now with the Millardville Residents Association. I want to have a say in the future of the region where my, uh, my kids are raised. But the feedback I get from our residents during hundreds of interactions with City Hall over the years is that decisions are made at City Hall before the public has their say. So two things, uh, bring some financial discipline to City Hall and also trying to bring our residents back into that decision making process. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. So one of the things I really want to champion is, is around some of our most marginalized groups in Coquitlam. I want to talk specifically about homelessness in Coquitlam. Uh, I've been a member of the Homelessness and Housing Task Group for a number of years, and there is so much more work for us to do here in this community. These are often our brothers, our sisters, our family members that grew up in this community and are living unhoused. We have a lot more to do to bring shelter space to Coquitlam. We have a shelter currently servicing the entirety of the Tri-Cities that is bursting at the seams. As a city councillor, I want to advocate for some of those folks who have been the most marginalized and to get some more shelter space for those to get housing because we know getting a roof over someone's head is the best way for them to get their life back on track and to get healing and mental health support. Thank you. Dennis? Great, thanks. Um, actually, build on some of the things we're doing already. I, I think Matt touches uh, the homelessness piece. We um, saw 3030 Gordon open in 2014. Great. The plan was that people would come in there, spend some time, and transition to next stage housing. That hasn't been there yet. We're starting to see it. We've got a partnership with SHARE um, uh, 43 Housing uh, over in Berquitlam that will see 20 shelter rate units, 50 rent geared to income rentals, and then 30 lower end market rentals. That's the type of creativity we need to bring across the city. If we truly want to address the, the affordability crunch, we need to ensure that we're creating the environment across the spectrum, housing for our kids to move out into that's affordable, housing for those folks that are marginalized, that need that additional support. And that's partnerships with our provincial government. That's getting our feds to actually put permanent money into housing, not just loans to build it, but actual permanent investments. I stood beside Minister Robinson when we announced the, uh, the piece. Thanks, Dennis. Oh, Sorry. All right, so that's the end of the question and answer session. Thank you so much, candidates. And thank you for everybody that participated in the Slido. So we're going to now move to the candidates' closing statements. Uh, you each, uh, as agreed, have a 30-second uh, window opportunity to make your closing pitch. And we'll start in the reverse order with Carl here. Uh, I'd like to thank the Chamber, my fellow candidates, and everyone in the audience for participating in this event. There's been some great ideas brought forward tonight, but we've only scratched the surface of what we need to do to move Coquitlam forward. I would love the opportunity to engage with you further. Please come speak to me this evening after the formal part of uh, the, the evening. And you can visit my website, carltrepanier.ca. Uh, you can email me, carl at carltrepanier.ca. Finally, I would be honored to have your vote on October 15th. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who made tonight possible. Challenges will continue. With the right leadership and with stable leadership, challenges will continue to be met. To support collaboration and good balanced policies so Coquitlam remains an attractive and welcoming place for all to live, work and play, vote Terry Towner on October 15th. Thank you. It is not about who works better. It is also about who works closer to the people, to hear them, and then to understand their expectation of this changing demographic. Let us continue building a city where, for, for everyone where all age groups can fulfill their 
um, uh, expectations and lifestyle that they can see themselves uh, enjoying it. Uh, I, I believe that I'm going to be the person that you can count on it. And uh, thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. I'm action-oriented. For the past five months, I have been working really hard to advocate for the expansion of the West Coast Express Service. I successfully gathered support from mayors, councillors, and residents of the eight cities served by the West Coast Express Service and organized a public awareness event which received extensive media coverage. If I'm elected, I will work even harder and more efficiently for you. So please vote for me, Harvey Sue. Just look for the uh, shortest last name, SU. You will go wrong with it. Thank you. I want to thank each and every candidate here for putting their name forward. I actually think everybody up on this stage is amazing and they want to serve the community. Elected need leaders need to work together to make courageous new policies and bridge the gaps between governments. We need to think and do differently if we are to tackle the enormous challenges ahead. For this, you can always count on me. Vote for Zoe on October 15th. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to listen to myself and all the candidates. You, the voters, have a difficult decision to make on election day. All the candidates have come here with strong credentials and ideas. What I would bring to the table if elected is strong financial experience and knowledge. I believe this would serve the citizens of Coquitlam well. Again, my name is Leslie Rosa, and I'd be honored to receive your vote on election day, October 15th. Thank you. And good luck to all the candidates. When you go to vote in October, consider voting for a candidate who truly represents the voters and residents of Coquitlam, one who will speak out against racism and for fair democracy and participation, one who will take the housing crisis seriously and with a proven track record on cr climate change, one who will work for pedestrian and cyclist safety, less traffic, and more space for businesses small and large. This October, I'm asking you to vote on your ballot for me, Benjamin Perry. Before I got into renewable energy, I spent a long time bartending, and I know how to listen. Before I did that, I spent 16 years working for Real Canadian Superstore, and I know how important every penny is when you're feeding your family. I will watch every penny when I'm trying to take care of you, my family. Vote Camp for Councillor. Thank you everyone for attending tonight. Uh, I consider it a great compliment that many of the other candidates uh, here tonight are advocating for ideas that I brought forward years ago. So when you hear about three bedroom housing, think double Z for Mazzarolo. When you hear about expanding parks, recreational facilities, Think double Z for Mazzarolo. When you hear about no campaign contributions from big developers, think double Z for Mazzarolo. And this October 15th, look for the double Z for Robert Mazzarolo for Coquitlam City Councilor. Thank you. So you're saying double Z, right? Okay, got it. Thank you very much for everybody and candidates for coming out tonight. I think what we've heard is Council's job is to listen, to learn, and to collaborate. I've got a proven track record over the last eight years of doing exactly that, delivering for residents on what they need. On October 15th, I'm asking you to please re-elect Dennis Marsden to City Council Coquitlam for responsive, experienced leadership. Thank you. Trish Mandeo. Some consider me a policy junkie. Some consider me a governance junkie. On October 15, go in the middle of the, of, the, of the ballot and look for Mandewo or the weird name that you will see there. Whether it's housing, mental health, or any issues that we're dealing with currently, you can be guaranteed that I will advocate for you, and you can be guaranteed that I will ask the hard questions. Vote Trish Mandewo on October 15.
It was my honor and privilege to speak in front of fellow citizens and candidates tonight. I promise that I will tackle all these issues mentioned tonight with my platform. A cutting edge medical city is our future. Please vote for Sean Lee. Thank you. Rob, you got to give me a little credit for uh, trying to remove the de developer money from our elections. Um, so I, I'm thankful I was able to touch on a few key points tonight. I want to touch on the ones I wasn't able to. My other priorities are investing in park sports and recreation, protecting our environment, and careful city spending. I'm going to have volunteers out in the lobby and outside the building this evening with my comprehensive platform. So please look for them and grab a flyer. And for more information, you can go to paullambert.ca. On October 15th, I'd ask that you consider voting Paul Lambert for City Council. Thank you. I would like to thank the chamber, the moderator, all the candidates on stage, and everyone in the audience uh, that's here in person or virtually uh, for engaging in the civic process. Um, you've heard many ideas tonight, and you have a lot to think about for this election. So I'll end on this. I'm a bridge builder, and I bring the experience, and I know the processes to get things done. I will build consensus so that we can all collaborate together and build a better future for our city in Coquitlam. Uh, thank you for your support. Please vote for Steve Kim. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. I wanted to hear Harvey Sting. And Steve, Steve was way too modest. He delivered more seniors' meals than any other council member, than pretty well anyone else in the program. I want to talk about building consensus. This council has done a great job. We have worked hard to make sure that we identify issues, work through them, and work together. And I think that's a strength that we showed the rest of the province and lots of councils that are looking at us and saying, how do they do that? So I really applaud all of these folks that have put their names forward. It's really important. So thanks. Best, most important, please vote. Hi, my name is Mark Mahovlich and I'm running for uh, Mayor of Coquitlam. And I would like to just make a comment on how bad the housing is now. There's homeless people everywhere in Coquitlam, and if you really look hard enough, you can see them. They're everywhere. Because the land development that's been going on and the pr increase in value of homes is out of control. And your taxes go with it too. And governments that abuse taxes, like take $3 million of COVID funding at a time where nobody's making any money and they give themselves bonuses, I guess, uh, from the city, I heard it was about $3 million for COVID relief for who knows where. But anyway, I'm just running on, a, on, a, on the platform that taxes should be lower and you should take care of the environment better. Residents don't expect their mayor to solve every problem. They expect their mayor to listen to residents and build a responsive city hall. I believe in the inspirational power of politics collaborative and hopeful politics that lifts people up and instills trust in the public when it comes to their elected representatives. I believe that that is why we are all gathered here tonight, to share in that vision and responsibility. Coquitlam, I would be honored to serve as your next mayor. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, Thank you for everybody for coming out tonight to, uh, to talk about the issues that are important to you. Coquitlam is a really well-run city, and we're fortunate that we have a council that works really well to together. And uh, I've proven that I can work with council to deliver new ideas and to deliver on, uh, on promises. But there's still a lot more work to do in the areas of managing growth, the environment, housing affordability, and public safety. And with your support, I look forward to continuing to work for you. I didn't get a chance to talk about a lot of the issues that are important as well, so please uh, just look at my brochure. You can scan the QR code to go to my website. So I'll start by thanking the Chamber again and thanking everyone who came out today. Local government is the stuff that affects us every single day. And it is so important. And for me, it's the stuff that excites me. So please, on October 15th, please vote for Matt DeJohn. Look, look for the DJ on the ballot on October 15th. <laughs> Thanks to all the candidates. I believe our city is uniquely positioned to prosper in the coming decades. With our educated workforce, our proximity to nature, 
our transportation improvements. I believe this is an ideal city to raise a family and grow a business. But we have to know that our local government is working for us. We have a 25% voter turnout in this city, but that's not our leader's problem. That's actually our responsibility. We can't just show up every four years and vote. We need to show up every single day, and that's what I've been trying to do with my communities. I've been working and advocating for communities ever since I moved to Kikwil. Hi there, my name is Phil Buckin. When I am elected, I will press for a city council that is transparent, that listens to citizens, and that put the concerns of all Coquitlam residents first. Firstly, by increasing the number of below market housing units and all new developments. Secondly, by increasing the frequency of bus service in our community. Lastly, by preserving our precious tree canopy that provides shade and, carb and absorbs carbon dioxide. Please vote for Phil Buckin on October 15th. You can check out my platform at www.philbuckin.ca. Thank you. Hi, Rob Bottas. Tonight you've heard different visions for our community. We sit at a crossroads. We can continue to be a bedroom community for the, rest of, for the rest of Metro Vancouver, or we can be a thriving city in our own right where our residents can live, work, and play. If we choose the latter, we need to ensure sustainable development of complete affordable neighborhoods that meet the needs of a diverse and growing population. This means offering a mix of housing alternatives, including affordable housing for seniors, families, and the most vulnerable. This means having a complete range of goods and services in our neighborhoods, along with the associated good paying jobs. I choose to embrace a thriving future for Coquitlam. Please vote Rob Bottas. Thank you, Brent Asmussen. I'm proud of my record on council. We've faced a lot of challenges. We're going to face more. I was there when we brought in the cold weather mat program for the homeless. I supported the shelter in Coquitlam to go a lot of opposition. I'm proud of where we're at on rental housing. We have 10,000 market rentals in the system. We have over 2,000 below and non-market in the system. We've been providing the facilities. We're opening up a brand new Millardville Community Centre. We're opening up a new YMCA. We opened up a new Sheffield Park. We just opened up the new expansion of Cottonwood Park because we know we have to expand those facilities to make this always the livable place. So October 15th, vote Brent Asmussen. All right. Well, thank you, candidates. Uh, just personally speaking, you made it very easy for me to be uh, the only person here no one came to hear tonight, so I appreciate that. Uh, thanks for participating, everybody. Thanks for those of you uh, online for uh, your uh, questions submitted through Slido. So let's give our candidates another round of applause. And the video recording uh, for this evening will be available shortly on the Chamber website at tricitieschamber.com if you want to uh, recap it. And thank you again uh, in particular to the Chamber Group Insurance Plan for sponsoring tonight's event and to our venue Evergreen Cultural Center. So please go vote on October 15th. Uh, thanks and have a good night.